Okay, uh, so today um, is uh, one of many webinar series we have done with the Chamber of Commerce here. Um, so this one is with NMAX Energy. Uh, we've put these series together for our Chamber members and businesses uh, so that you all can have a chance to hear, hear from and ask questions from the experts uh, that we have in our membership. Uh, this morning we have two great representatives from NMAX, um, Roger Wellman and Martin Drinkwalter. Um, so at, uh, Roger and Martin are going to go through their presentation and at the end we have set aside time for any questions that you may have. Uh, there is a Q&A box that you can type your questions into and we'll go through them at the end. Um, if you prefer, there is also a raise your hand feature and then I can unmute your microphone and you can ask your question that way. Uh, so I did put a link for the slide deck in the chat box, um, but everything will be available on our website afterwards, including the recording if you need to watch it over again. All right, so I'd like to now introduce you to Roger and Martin. Uh, so Roger has more than 35 years in the marketing and engineering segments of both the electric, utility, and petroleum industries. As the Director of Energy Services, Roger leads the Energy Management Office at NMAX Energy. The Energy Management Office team provides dedicated enhanced energy services for NMAX Energy's large government and institutional related, uh, retail customers. Roger's focus is on ensuring an exceptional customer experience while delivering integrated energy-based solutions designed specifically for their operational needs. And then we have Martin, who is the Manager of Energy Solutions for the Energy Management Office. Martin leads the specialized team of professionals focused on delivering enhanced management services for large retail businesses, such as facility demand and rate class analysis, project management, and site evaluation for renewable generation. So I will uh, now pass it along to you gentlemen and uh, you can get started. Just tell me next slide whenever you're ready. All right. Thanks, Kendra. Um, and hello to everyone on the call. Uh, today, Martin and I are going to be speaking to some basic energy management tips and some items to consider in your business. Uh, and we're going to focus on a few areas, like understanding the basic elements that will make up the cost of the electricity that you see in your bill, tips on saving energy in areas like office equipment, lighting, operations and maintenance, and heating and cooling. And we'll take a quick look at some free online energy management software and some potential incentive opportunities that may be available to your business. So as we go through this information, it's important to keep in mind that what we're presenting to is potentially a, quite a varied group of businesses and that no one solution is gonna fit everybody's business. So what we're gonna focus on today is just some simple tips and then they probably just seem like common sense. But as the saying goes, common sense isn't always that common and sometimes we forget or maybe we don't have the time to consider the quick wins in energy use that might be available to you. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a lot of challenges for a lot of businesses. So even a couple of extra dollars saved on your energy bill can hopefully make a little bit of a difference. So at NMAX, we've seen the usage data of customers that we would normally expect to be pretty similar and we've seen them really vary a lot while they were either shut down or under reduced operations during the pandemic here. And as an example, we had two schools that were actually very similar in size and very similar in their normal operating load kind of pre-pandemic. And then during, during the shutdown, when they, were, when they were closed down, one school had reduced their consumption by 80%, while the other one had only reduced their consumption by 30%. Now there might be some kind of unique operations in, in one of the schools to explain that large difference in energy usage, but part of the answer might be due to some of the simple items that we're looking at today. So next slide, please, Kendra. Oh, sorry, yeah, next one after that. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so the, the first step is often educating yourself on how energy is used in your business and then in turn, educating your fellow employees or tenants, if, if you have tenants, in basic energy saving practices and programs that might lead to simple savings. The second step is to make those practices a habit. Develop an energy management strategy. It's easy to forget simple tips and lose that initial advantage that you might have gained. And thirdly, you want to check to see if the steps that you've taken have impacted to your bill and to what extent. If you see some bit of successes, 
let your fellow employees know and let them know that their efforts are helping so that you continue to see those benefits and then they continue to support those efforts. Next slide, please, Kendra. So first, let's take a look at how you pay for the energy that your business uses. So commercial customers typically pay for the energy they consume, which is the kilowatt hours that you use, plus you pay for, uh, on a regulated rate that's approved by the Alberta Utilities Commission, or the AUC, and that's for the wires provider in your area to deliver the energy to your site. Both the energy and the wires components are typically included on the bill that's provided by your retailer. So energy charges are based on the kilowatt hours that you consume in a month. So that's a variable charge and you can use, cause you can use a lot, you know, different, different volumes of kilowatt hours in any given month. While the wire or the delivery charges are based on both the variable kilowatt hours and the peak demand, which is more of a fixed charge and that's typically measured in kilowatts or what they call KVA or kilovolt amperes. So, it's important to note that the peak demand is measured on a 15 minute average basis. So a customer only needs to set a peak like well above your normal operating demand for 15 minutes and your entire month of charges will be based on that peak demand that you set by operating at a higher level for only 15 minutes. And then additionally on top of that, most wires rates for small commercial and larger com customers have what is called a ratchet. And what that means is that the monthly peak demand that you set is typically billed on the higher of the actual peak that you set during the month or a percentage, and in most cases, in a lot of rates, that's 85% of the highest peak that you set in the past 12 months. So what that means is that as a customer, you could set a peak well above your normal operating load you could run for 15 minutes. So let's say you turn on a motor that you don't normally turn on. You turn on this motor, it runs for only 15 minutes and that sets your peak higher. Now that peak is used to, to bill you for the, for the peak on the monthly charges. And if that 85% of that peak is higher than your normal operating load, you will bill on that 85% for the next 12 months. So the way, I, the way I like to say it is run for 15 minutes and pay for a year. So it's just something important to kind of keep note of when you're in your, you know, during your operations, um, what is running at any given time that could produce or set that peak demand. So an example of the split between the energy costs and the wires cost for an average small and medium commercial customer is shown on this pie chart here on the bottom. So for this example, I use the current posted Fortis rates, and those are Fortis Alberta, and I'm assuming that most of the people on this call are probably Fortis Alberta customers. So what I used was rate 41 for a small commercial customer and rate 61 for a medium to large commercial customer. So you can see here in, the, in this pie chart that the cost split is weighted a little bit more toward the wire side, and which, really highlights that it's important to consider both the impact of the energy and the delivery charges on your monthly costs. And these cost splits can vary um, as energy and wires rates change, but this is a reasonable split at this given point in time. Next slide, please, Kendra. So what I've tried to illustrate here is the impact of reducing either your energy use or your energy and your peak demand in these two tables. So the first table is for, uh, on using rate 41. So that's for a small commercial customer in Fortis territory. And it shows the monthly saving opportunity of reducing your first level, your energy by 25%, but your demand, your peak demand stays the same. And then on the third line, both your peak kilowatts or your peak demand and your energy both reduced by 25%. So you can see here that the cost drops, you know, a bit by reducing your energy, but then it drops more by reducing energy and demand. And the second example is the same thing, only it's using uh, Fortis rate 61. And so that's for a medium to large commercial customer. So 
you can see here by reducing your, your energy consumption by 25%, that reduces your monthly cost by roughly 13 and 16% respectively. But if you can reduce both energy and demand by 25%, your monthly cost reduces by roughly 22 and 24% respectively. So almost on a one-to-one -one basis. So as I mentioned before, additional savings opportunities can result by considering both energy and your peak demand impact on your business. Okay, now you have to consider the impact of the ratchet in there as well. So if you are able to reduce your peak demand by quite a bit, that ratchet will play a role for a few months before your costs will truly drop to the total amount that you could possibly gain. Next slide, please, Kendra. So one of the other things that can result in additional costs is if your equipment has a poor power factor. So for most of the wires delivery rates for small and commercial or larger customers, the peak demand is also based on the greater of the actual meter peak measured in kilowatts during the month or 90% of the actual metered peak measured in KVA. So the meter records typically both kilowatts and KVA and it will set your, your peak demand and the amount you build on based on the higher of the two. So since the power factor calculation is kilowatts divided by KVA, if you have a power factor of less than 90%, you would pay for your peak demand based on the KVA you're using instead of the kilowatts. So what that means is in effect, you are paying a bit of a penalty for operating less efficiently since you're using more KVA than the wires provider expects you to. So the table that I show there indicates the monthly cost for the demand portion of the Fortis wires rate 61 for a power factor, first of all, that's slightly above 90% and then decreasing. So what's important to note here is that in all three cases, the kilowatt peak is still 100 and that's the real work being done in the operation. So that remains the same, but because the power factor is dropping below 90%, your demand charge on the wires rate increases because the measured KVA has increased. So you can see in that first example, the power factor is 91%, so it's above 90, so you're actually billing on the peak kilowatts. But in the next two examples, where it drops to 77 and 67%, you're, you're being billed on the peak KVA because that starts to rule. So power factor can be improved in, a, in, a, in an operation or in a customer's site in a number of ways. And the most common way is through the addition of capacitors that store and provide energy when needed that reduces the KVA required from the wires provider. So the options to improve power factor are actually fairly, fairly widely varied, and they're, but they're very specific to each site scenario, and they generally require upfront costs to fix the issue. So payback is really dependent on the scenario, and it may not make sense in all cases, but it's definitely something you should take a look at if your power factor is below 90%. Next slide, please, Kendra. So now let's move over to some really basic tips for managing your energy use. And let's start with some potential easy wins in office equipment. So you should always try to ensure that phantom power users like computers, computer monitors, speakers, and charging stations are not always on, either by putting them to sleep with their power management functions or using the smart power strip that can be turned off when it's not in use. Sleep modes on a lot of the equipment typically only use a fraction of the energy that, that the equipment uses when they're in a full operating mode. So this goes for larger electronics like printers and copiers and scanners as well. So just as an example, 10 laptops, if they're running continuously and not in a, in a sleep mode, they'll use somewhere in the neighborhood of, of the equivalent of 10 60 watt bulbs. So it really does add up if you're doing that on a 24 hour basis. So you should always try to turn that stuff off or put it into a sleep mode whenever possible. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it over to Martin and he's gonna look at other energy saving opportunities tied more to the equipment that's essential to your operations. Go ahead, Martin. All right, next slide, please. Um, thank you very much, Roger. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, allowing us to talk to you today. I'm just gonna take a look at a couple of the 
easy wins that you can make in your facility to help uh, you reduce your overall energy uh, consumption. Uh, we're going to start off with lighting. And lighting is a very, what I call, low-hanging fruit when it comes to energy conservation. Uh, typically, lighting can take up to 30 to 40% of a facility's energy usage. And where we can implement new technologies or actual um, programs, we can uh, reduce that overall cost. So by utilizing natural sunlight and turning off lights, we can save up to 40% of your overall uh, lighting uh, energy usage. Uh, this is just an easy win. Open up those blinds, turn off the lights when you're not there, and uh, we can reduce those overall costs. Uh, if we can't do this, we can incorporate uh, sensors, both daylight and occupancy sensors. These will take care of taking or turning off lights when not required and reduce your overall energy consumption. Uh, a lot of times our uh, spaces are overlit. Uh, we don't need all the light that is are, uh, put into a facility or into a space. Uh, turning off those lights and utilizing task lighting can also give you an easy win and reduce your overall uh, energy usage through your uh, lighting system. Um, LED lighting retrofits. This is where we can incorporate new technology and reduce our overall energy costs. Uh, LED lighting can save you up to 50% of your overall electricity use on lighting uh, compared to incandescent and fluorescent. Uh, so take a look at, if you have not already, uh, what an LED lighting retrofit will look like and how much you can actually save uh, through a, a facility design. Uh, and finally is the operational and maintenance. Re remove and replace burnt out lights. Uh, burnt out lights and ballast still uh, use energy. Uh, so basically you're supplying energy to uh, fixtures that aren't actually providing what they're required to provide. And uh, just by replacing those bulbs and replacing those ball uh, ballasts, you'll be able to uh, take full advantage of the lighting that's there and not waste energy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, controlling your operational and maintenance is also uh, a key win in regards to energy uh, savings. Uh, regularly check and maintain equipment. Uh, poorly running equipment uh, uses more energy um, than uh, equipment that is actually specific, are doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, inspect all your insulation, all your piping and ducting. Uh, insulation is there to either uh, save you on the heating or cooling that is required by those pipes. So make sure that the uh, insulation is kept up to uh, standards and you're not wasting that heat. Uh, minimize your demand and your energy charges. Optimize your startup time and power down times. Starting up all your equipment at the exact same time, like Roger uh, uh, mentioned before, will set a new peak demand. So if you can actually stagger that startup time, we don't operate all the equipment at the exact same time, so you're going to reduce that overall demand. Uh, same thing with sequencing, lighting, fans, all these things can be started up at different times and can be sequenced through uh, building automation systems. Uh, conduct nighttime audits. A lot of times what we see in a facility is that things are running when they're not supposed to be running. And this typically happens at night. So are lights being left on? Is there anything that's actually starting or stopping uh, operating when you're not there? So if you can do this once in a while, just walk around your facility and see what's actually occurring at night, this can also uh, help save on energy costs. Uh, plan your uh, janitorial schedules. Make sure that uh, your uh, or your uh, cleaning staff uh, also have the education they require to make sure that they're not just turning on all equipment and all lights at one time and having it on so that whole point in, of the schedule of their cleaning schedule that all that equipment is running and doesn't have to be running. And develop a preventative maintenance program, making sure that walk arounds are completed so that all equipment is operating properly, all insulation is actually uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing and making sure that uh, all, all the necessary requirements for energy reduction are taking place. Next slide, please. Um, so as part of your O&M, uh, certain things that uh, we can take a look at, uh, simple adjustments can be made throughout a facility, um, one of those being your thermostats. One degree up or down here or there, can save on your cooling requirements as well as your heating requirements. Uh, no one can really tell me the difference between uh, 21 degrees 
and 20 degrees Celsius, but actually those, that one degree Celsius can save you on your energy consumption. Uh, ventilation, uh, making sure that uh, all your ventilation equipment is, is uh, properly being maintained. Uh, this is big on, uh, on your uh, filters on your ventilation equipment. A plug filter or a dirty filter makes equipment work harder and the harder working equipment uses more energy. Uh, utilize window coverings. Uh, do not let in the sunlight when not required. Sunlight brings in heat. If you're trying to cool a building, that, uh, that heat's gonna make the uh, cooling equipment work harder. Same thing in the winter. Open up the blinds. Make sure you can utilize that uh, the free sunlight and that free heating. Uh, one of the big ones is overhead doors. Make sure that all windows and uh, exterior doors are closed uh, when not required to be open. Overhead door lets a lot of cooling out and lets a lot of heat out. So make sure that only overhead doors only utilize uh, when required. Uh, the basic maintenance, again, I go back to the filters, making sure the filters are clean and new and so that equipment doesn't have to work harder. Uh, calibrate all your thermostats. Make sure all your set points are where you want them to be and take control of those uh, thermostats away from people. Um, it's typical for people to uh, turn thermostats up or down when not required. Um, so just make sure that you have control over that. Uh, keep all your condenser and evaporator coils clean. Again, uh, plug, the, plug coils, make equipment work harder. Uh, and if you do have a compressed air system in your facility, make sure there's no leaks. Uh, a leak in a compressed air system makes the uh, motors work harder and run more. So make sure that all leaks are repaired and that your compressors don't have to work as hard. And again, I go back to repair and replace all the insulation. Make sure that the heating and cooling is kept where it's needed to be and it's not lost due, fault, due to faulty uh, insulation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, other considerations to look at, and Roger has touched it on, on this, is to educate yourself. And one thing is to understand how and where you're using energy and electricity. We can do this by utilizing not only the information that's provided by your retailer or your wire service provider, but we can install submeters. Submeters give you the ability to know when and where you're using electricity and potentially give you opportunities to see where we can save that, save that electricity. Um, measure and track your performance. Take a look at when you do hit your peaks and what is, what is happening for you to hit your peaks. By tracking this, this will give you the understanding of where you can actually reduce your overall energy consumption. And completing energy audits will help you determine what potential programs or uh, what potential efficiency measures you can take uh, to reduce your overall electricity cost. A lot of times these level one energy audits give you the basic understanding that you require to uh, implement these programs and they're not, they are cost effective, so they won't break the bank. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some online tools. And they, these are free online tools to help you with your energy management program. Uh, through Enercan, there's a red screen program that you can download and you can take uh, or make use of this program to track your energy consumption in your energy programs. Uh, this will give you the tools to implement new programs or to implement energy efficiency uh, opportunities. Uh, energy Star is another uh, great tool that you can utilize to track your uh, greenhouse gas emissions and to uh, implement overall energy programs. Next slide, please. Um, in the past, we've seen through uh, federal and provincial governments, uh, energy programs that, or energy uh, uh, funding programs uh, that they implement to help you uh, reduce your overall energy consumption and to implement uh, energy saving programs. Uh, we, at this point in time, that I'm aware of, do not have any of these programs available. Um, there is belief, and there was belief at the start of the year, that the provincial government was going to come out with uh, some funding opportunities. These have not taken place as of yet, and, I mean, a pandemic is, is one reason for that. Um, there are federal opportunities that will help alleviate some of the costs, and these are attached here. And in and around the, or sorry, in the uh, Edmonton area, there is a PACE program that uh, has been set up to help uh, finance energy efficiency upgrades. So if you're in those areas or can take advantage of some of these funding opportunities, I would uh, suggest that you do. Next slide, please. 
again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can contact uh, Ronnie. Uh, he is the sales manager for the Edmonton area, and he can direct any other questions to the uh, the appropriate people. People, uh, I thank you for your time, and uh, I'll turn it back to Kendra. All right, uh, thank you guys so much for that. That was very informative. Um, we do have a couple questions in the Q and A here. Um, so the first one is from Adrian. And he's just wondering how how does peak demand get impacted after a power outage? Uh, I I can take that one. Um, yeah, it's it's boy, it's it's kind of dependent on on your operation. So, um, so after an outage, and and so let's say you're you're starting up uh, a bunch of equipment. Um, uh, you know, the, the motor startup time is fairly quick. Obviously, you use a lot a lot of uh, a lot of demand to start motors, but it's a very, very short time period. And I mentioned before that the peak meter demand is based on a 15 minute average. So it does play a role when the motors start up, but it plays, you know, a relatively small role. Um, but what, what I think what we've seen before though, quite a bit is after an outage, uh, a business will start up and, and, let's say there's a little bit of a backlog in the operation all of a sudden and, and you try to run the equipment kind of harder for a little while to make up for lost production or, or you know, to, to move some more volume through your systems depending on whatever your operation is. And that kind of thing can really set a new peak. So what, what I'd suggest is that, you know, if, if you've got a situation where you had an outage and then you, you're coming back is like Martin mentioned, try to stagger stuff. You know, you don't maybe necessarily need to catch up your operation in, in 15 minutes or an hour. Stagger it out over a few hours to lessen the impact of that peak demand because that can stick with you, like I said, on the ratchet for another 12 months. Right? And I hope that answers the question. Oh. One more You're on me. <laughs> One more question here. Um, does an empty light socket use any energy? Uh, an incandescent light socket won't use any electricity. Um, but if you do have a fluorescent, uh, fluorescent uh, fixture, you do have a ballast. That ballast does use electricity, whether there is a tube in that fixture or not. So, um, yeah, any, any socket, fluorescent socket will use the ballast, will use electricity. Okay, very interesting. I did not know that. Um, I have a few other questions here as well. Um, how do you find out what wire or delivery rate you're on? Uh, I'll take that one. Um, normally, that would be indicated on the bill that's provided by your retailer. Now, every retailer's bills look look a bit different, um, so I you know I can't can't speak to it directly, but in general in kind of the more of the detailed area around your wires or delivery charges section of your bill, you should likely be able to see the rate code or a description of the, the type of rate that you're on that's that your wire that your wire delivery provider is is got you on. And and if it's not shown or you can't find it, you know, contact your retailer or contact your wires provider and they should be able to determine that information for you. Okay. Um, is solar more economical compared to grid power? Um, at this point in time, we have uh, historically low power prices, so it is difficult for solar to compete with those power prices. Uh, you have to look at solar holistically as it will uh, produce power for our 25 plus years. So you have to take a look at what the cost of power over that 25 year period to figure out whether solar is economical. What we're seeing today, solar can be all in at about 12 to 14 cents per, uh, uh, per kilowatt, whereas the typical grid power with delivery would run you anywhere between nine to 10 cents. So at this snapshot point in time, um, it is a little bit more expensive, but again, over the 25 year period, we could see some savings over the utilizing solar. Okay. Um, is power factor correction a good option to reduce energy or sorry, a good option to reduce electricity costs? Uh, power factor correction, as, uh, as Roger mentioned earlier, is definitely a, an opportunity with uh, the Fortis rates. 
uh, especially if it is below the 90%. Uh, once you're in that 95, 90% or above, uh, the cost to actually repair uh, for power factor uh, outweighs the actual savings. So uh, there, there would be really no benefit if your uh, power factor is above 90%. Uh, if you're getting into that 80 to below 80%, that's definitely when you're going to see a, uh, a savings associated with power factor correction. Okay. Now, we lost Roger there for a sec. He might be able to jump back in. Um, but I guess the rest, of these couple more questions, and I guess they're going to you, Martin. Um, okay. Is LED lighting still a good option with lower electricity costs? Oh, absolutely. LED light, lighting has come down remarkably in the past few years, uh, as well as not only saving you on the energy or the uh, consumption of energy uh, over uh, fluorescent or incandescent, the operational maintenance costs will also uh, provide you with savings. Uh, LED lights, uh, some state that they're good for 100,000 hours. I haven't been around for 100,000 hours. I'm not sure who has, but uh, you can typically expect to see LED lighting last for 50,000 hours at a minimum. So with that being said, not replacing your bulbs as uh, frequent as you would have in the past will not only save you on the electricity side, but will save you on the O&M side as well. Okay. And do wire service providers have different rates? And if so, can I change wire service providers? Uh, wire service providers uh, do have different rates. Um, you cannot choose, like your retail co or contract, you cannot choose your wire service provider. Uh, they do have a franchise for that territory and you are basically uh, their customer if you're hooked up to their wires. Okay. And that is all I have for questions. Is there anybody else who's got questions? Um, Adrian, any more questions? Or Allison or Irina? Or Tracy? Okay. And well, if you guys do have any more questions, you do have uh, Ronnie's information there on this last slide. Um, and so if you've got questions, you can email him or um, call us here at the chamber and we'll put you in touch uh, with whoever you need as well. Um, so I appreciate everybody joining us today. Um, so thank you, Roger and Martin. That was definitely some great information. Welcome back, Roger. <laughs> Sorry about that. I totally lost the connection there. That's okay. Um, so just before we wrap up, I would like to thank all of our chamber members uh, for their support and for trusting us as your chamber of commerce. Um, we have definitely been trying to work diligently to provide you the information you need to get the answers to your questions uh, during these crazy times. Um, we do hope to see everybody at any or at all of our future events. Um, first up and next week on Tuesday we have Shameless Plug, um, so that's coming back online with Zoom. And then in um, the end of October, the 21st and 22nd is our Small Business Week conference, and so we're excited to have. Michelle Romano from uh, Dragon's Den, and Clarence Louie, who is the chief of the Soyuz Indian Band. Uh, so we're very excited for both of those, so make sure you're registered, and uh, we'll see you sometime in the future. Thank you, Martin and Roger. Thanks. Thank you.